All right, hello everybody, and today we're going to talk about uh, labels and legal, uh, specifically uh, labels going on your package, whether it be glass bottles or aluminum cans, and the legal issues um, that surround what we can put on a label, what we are required by law to put on a label, and also the cake colors uh, that we put on our cakes. Uh, so labeling the package. Uh, and something I did not include here, uh, but is important to, to note that the keg needs to have a label. Uh, and that label is the cardboard keg collar that goes on your keg. That's, that's the legal labeling information. Uh, but labeling our package. So the, the quickest method that one of these or one of these glass packages can be labeled is inline labeling. So it's going through your, your packaging line, it exits the filler, it exits the seamer, it exits the capper, and it goes straight into the, the labeling section, which applies a label in a very fast uh, method. Or you can have an individual label applicator, which you is a little more manual. Well, it's a lot more manual, but uh, better than hand applied. Hand applied. Uh, you get a, a naked can or a naked bottle coming off your packager and you actually put it on your device, you activate the device and it puts a label on and you take it off and you set it in a different spot. Um, it can be quick but there's still a, a human aspect there so you can have error introduced into the process. Uh, hand applied labels, the slowest method you could ever possibly imagine for labeling product uh, and believe me I've done it. Uh, we have had teams of people sitting around labeling hundreds of bottles that we packaged. Uh, it's a pain in the butt, but sometimes it's the only option that you have. Uh, we've got different types of labels, uh, pressure activated adhesive, moisture activated adhesive, and uh, different labeling materials that we'll look into as well. Uh, Inline labeling, the quickest, most convenient method. Uh, it eliminates the need of a paid employee to, to do the labeling. Uh, the trade-off of that is uh, inline labels are very expensive. Uh, I guess really that depends on the uh, overall cost of your packaging uh, system. Uh, the most expensive, like I said, the smallest machine that you can get to hook in line to a packaging system is in the range of about sixteen thousand uh, dollars, which sounds like a lot, but if you're pairing that up to a high-speed Inline label, inline bottle or can filler. You know, you're you're looking at the range of a a, a packaging machine that probably runs closer to a hundred thousand dollars. You know, sixteen thousand in relation to that is not that much. Uh, but sixteen thousand dollars in relation to a much smaller, uh, slower canning or bottling operation, it can be a significant cost. And depending on the speed of your, your filler and seamer operation, you may need to have an accumulation table placed in between or uh, a little bit of a delay on your, on your line because sometimes you might have a filling machine that runs a little faster than your packaging machine. Uh, and that is something very important to think about with every step of your process. Uh, can your in-feed stuff, so your depalletizer, your, your rinser, can it supply enough cans so that your filler is not delayed by any means. Uh, on the back side of the packaging, can your label applicator or uh, supplementary packaging material, can it keep up with the output of your packaging machine? Uh, and you want to make sure that the machines that you get are adjustable or sized appropriately. <clears throat> and the most common label for this type of uh, label applicator is pressure sensitive, but you can also get some uh, moisture, moisture activated uh, and also a couple of other things, but the most common one nowadays is the pressure sensitive label. And this is the uh, $16,000 unit I was, I was talking about. It's the ELF 50. Uh, it will generally keep up with you know, around 20 cans a minute or something like that. Uh, but uh, that is the that's your entry point for an inline label. It's a significant hurdle for some. Uh, 
individual label applicator. It labels one can or bottle, one package at a time. Uh, package must be placed and removed by hand. Uh, much cheaper than an inline option, maybe around $1,600 to $2,000 each. Uh, so, not in line, but still a little expensive, uh, but significantly cheaper than an inline labeler. The problem is you need a person running that station, uh, which can introduce potential error uh, issues with placement as well. And that looks like this here. Um, so your package goes right here, you press the activator button, it rolls around and uh, one label is applied and you can take it right off. Hand applied labels. And it's tedious and time consuming. Uh, it's even more tedious if you have to hand write some of the information on your labels. Uh, that's where it gets really, really exhausting. Uh, and it's very likely to be crooked, your labels that are going to have that, that ends that don't meet up, one slightly higher on one side, it just sets the nature of human applied labels. Uh, the advantage is there's no upfront investment, there's just labor. So if you have small packaging runs, this is the way to do it. You know, if you're only going to be packaging five cases of product, it doesn't make any sense even to get the individual applicator. Uh, once you get to the point where you're going to be doing a significant amount of packaging, this is going to be, or your uh, single app product applicator is going to be your, your entry point. Uh, the advantage here is it allows your labels to be made of any material and to be applied on bottles of any size or shape. So it doesn't really matter what your bottles look like, you're going to be able to apply them because you've got that human element being able to uh, adjust what they're doing. Depending on your adhesive, some are easier than others. Um, with your moisture activated ones, it's very easy because usually your product's going to be cold and it's going to cause a significant amount of condensation. So your moisture activated glue gets activated. The problem with that is it stays activated. It can move around on your package uh, and it doesn't really stop moving until that condensation evaporates off your product warms up a little bit. Uh, that glue is given a chance to, to dry. Uh, the other disadvantage there is you put it in a cooler and your label's going to want to walk around or fall off. <clears throat> uh, kind of get ahead of myself here. Label material. So we've got some paper-based material. Uh, the issue with paper-based material is it doesn't stand up to moisture uh, very well. You can't put a paper-based label into a cooler of ice. It is going to get destroyed. Uh, we have used vinyl based labels in the past and they stand up really well uh, to moisture and mechanical issues. Uh, be a little pricey. And then you've got your metallic feeling, metallic uh, labels. They're, they're quite thin. Those are typically not hand applied. Uh, we've got pressure sensitive labels so you put it on and you really start to massage it on and that's where the glue really starts to stick. You put one of those on, you have a, a second, you can take it off and readjust. But for the most part, once you put it on there and create some kind of pressure, that's going to be a semi-permanent. Uh, you've got cut and stack labels. Uh, those are ones that you can either do with hand applied or there are some uh, significant high volume ones that use uh, machines to pick those up to cut and stack and put them onto uh, a package as well. And then we've also got shrink sleeves. So that's an interesting concept. So you've got any kind of can, if it already has a uh, printed can or a label on it, you can put a shrink sleeve over it, shrink it down, and you've got a new product labeled with, uh, without wasting your, your previously labeled package. Uh, keg collars. Kegs are a package that needs labeling. We discussed this at the beginning. So this is basically just a, a piece of thin cardboard, uh, either rectangular, square, or round, shaped and it fits around that bone on a keg and that becomes that keg's label so there are requirements that are that need to be on there the same requirements that need to be on any other label as well uh, and that brings us to the TTV requirements The TTB is the uh, 
division of ATF, the government, that we deal with as far as breweries go. And pardon me, this was only available as a PDF. Uh, of course, the TTB disclaimer is going to be uh, this is to help the public understand and comply with laws and regulations. Uh, basically saying this is not legal advice, so uh, follow at your own risk. Mandatory label information. So this is the information that is required to be on brand name label. So you got to have your brand name, your class, name and address, net contents, and the alcoholic content. Uh, maybe on any label. They're going to definitely require I don't know why they use May, but you're going to have to have the government health warning. Uh, if it's imported, you've got to have the name and address, the country of origin, uh, and a declaration of certain ingredients. Uh, if you use dyes, you've got to put it on there. If you use artificial sweeteners, you've got to put it on there. Um, and some basic stuff. Your label must be readily legible under ordinary conditions and must appear on a contrasting background. Uh, so if you've got uh, a background color with your text in a certain color, it doesn't not contrast well enough, they kind of blend together, it's not easy to read, you're not going to get label approval from the TTB uh, through the online submission process called COLA, or Certificate of Label uh, Approval. Uh, they're going to send it back to you and say it needs to be contra contrasted better. Other than the brand name, it must be in English, with exceptions for malt beverages bottled for consumption in Puerto Rico. Uh, so your brand name can be anything, uh, but all of your important stuff, like the government warning, uh, the contents, and all that stuff, it has to be labeled in English. What we have here is kind of an example um, of an application for, <coughs> pardon me, Certificate of Label uh, Approval. Uh, what you've got to have here is the name of your beer. You've got to have the brand name on it. Uh, and then your brewery name and the address. you got to have the style. And there are certain things that the government wants you to put there. Uh, there are very few designations that they recognize. And we'll, we'll cover those in just a minute you got to have the net contents, so the volume that's in your package, that is something that they're picky on as well. Uh, got to have the government warning, and that's basically saying uh, you shouldn't drink when you're pregnant, and uh, if you drink, it's going to impair your ability to make decisions and drive a car. Uh, oops. <clears throat> This is the name under which the malt beverage is marketed. So uh, this is Edgewood. That is the brand name of this beer. Uh, if you don't identify a brand name, the name of the bottle or importer is considered the brand name. So uh, if we were to import this Henderson beer from another country, it would just be Henderson if we didn't assign it a brand name. Uh, some issues that they see uh, the class type is entered in the brand name. So if you're entering your application and you put in beer or ale as the brand name, that's not really the brand name of the product. It might be an ale, uh, and that is important information to list on a certain part of the application, but Edgewood is the name of this, and that is what should go in the brand name section. Uh, you got to have the city and state of the bottler or packer. Um, bottler, bottle is what the government calls any packaging. When you bottle something into kegs, that's kegging. They're silly about it. Uh, gotta have the trade name or the DBA name of your uh, company that's allowed. Uh, the principal place of business. <clears throat> uh, if you have multiple locations, you're gonna want to list your, your main place where you're headquartered. That can be just as simple as brewed and packed by, and then list your main, your main location. Uh, some of the issues that they notice, some people forget to put your name and address on a label. Uh, that's basic stuff. You've got to put your name and address on your label. Uh, city and state on the label don't match on the address. Make it match. It's simple. 
the contract brewer and producer is not added to the contractee's DBA trade name. So if your beer is contract brewed and packaged by a different brewery, that has to be on that label. Uh, you can't hide it. It's something that you got to legally disclose. Uh, and the label contains name and address of the contractee and not the contract brewer or producer. Same thing. If you contract a brewery to make and package your beer, you have to put their name and your name on that label. So here, what I was talking about when they get a little uh, weird about the net contents, the volume. So it's got to be in English units of measure. Uh, so if your package is less than a pint, for example, we have an 8-ounce can, the Designation on the label has to say 8 fluid ounces, abbreviated as FL.OZ. Or it has to be listed as 1 half pint or 0 0.5 pint. When you have a pint, you are not allowed to write 16 fluid ounces. They will send it back and tell you, you can't do that, that's not appropriate. But how is that consistent? Uh, anyway, if you package in pint cans, your Disclosure of net contents must say one pint or one PT period. If it's over a pint, that's where you can go back to using ah, the uh, fluid ounces and stuff. So if you're, let's say you're 20 ounces, you've got a can that, that fits 20 ounces in there. Uh, that is one pint, four fluid ounces. Or, look at that, you can use quarts as too, like anybody knows what five-eighths of a quart is. <clears throat> when you get to quart, let's say you've got a crawler that is 32 ounces, you legally have to package it at one quart, or one QT. You can put 32 fluid ounces on there as well, but you legally have to meet one quart. And if you get to more than that, which we're not really going to be packaging too much as far as that goes, uh, you have to start using the quarts and gallons and <coughs> all that fun stuff. Um, if you want to, you can include the metric designation, so if you had a 750 bottle. Uh, but you have to legally still have the pints and fluid ounces. So it's one pint, 9.4 fluid ounces, or 750 milliliters. Uh, they are picky about it. They will send it back if it's not 100% correct talked about here. They're just acceptable formats. One pint, one pint, 473 milliliters. They do not. They will send it back. We've had stuff sent back because we put on there 16 fluid ounces because that's what we thought they wanted. No. One pint. You can list both, but it has to have at least one pint on it. And then you get to your alcohol content. They're very strict about how they want this worded as well. Uh, we very commonly abbreviate alcohol content as ABV, alcohol by volume. ABV is not an appropriate legal designation. Uh, we must have, if we do it alcohol by volume, we must have alcohol, blank percentage by volume, or you can have um, alcohol slash volume. They do not want any further abbreviation than this. ABV, no. If you do alcohol by weight, which not a whole lot of people do, some states might require it. It's kind of silly. Uh, same thing there. You cannot do ABW. Uh, you got to have alcohol percentage by weight. Uh, that percentage has to be on there at some point as well. Whether it be in the middle, at the end, at the beginning, if you don't have that percent sign on there, they are going to send it back. If somehow you use an extract that has uh, added alcohol content to your beer, you have to include that listing on your label that you've added alcohol content from using an extract, uh, which you probably shouldn't do anyway. You're going to have to submit a formula in order to do that. But uh, Again, like I said earlier, they do not allow ABV. They would prefer that you do 5% alcohol slash vol or alcohol by vol 
or spell it all out and alcohol by volume. Uh, picky, they are picky. So this, the government warning, the health warning statement, must be readily legible under ordinary conditions and on a contrasting background. It's got to be significantly contrasting. Black on white, white on black, blue on orange, orange on blue, something that is going to cause a significant amount of contrast. <clears throat> it must be separate and apart from all other text. I would highly recommend that you surround it by this box because that offers that separate and uh, partition from all of everything else. Uh, they also do not want quotation marks around any of this whatsoever. <clears throat> Ask me how I know. The words government warning must appear in capital letters and bold. Uh, most designers that are familiar with uh, packaging or designing beer packaging are going to know these basic things. Uh, but if you're working with someone who's new or if you're doing it yourself, this is extremely important. They will send it back if this is not followed exactly. So class and type. This is where we get even more oh, antiquated and idiotic. Uh, the specific identity of malt beverage must be on your package. Uh, the designation of malt beverage is based on trade understandings and the characteristics. So here are your accepted ones. Ale, beer, malt liquor, stout, ice beer, porter, and any of pale ale are all acceptable classes. Anything outside of that is a fanciful name defined by the government and not sufficient as a class designation. Uh, so when, you, when you're looking at some other brewery's package and you see this random beer listed on their label somewhere out of context, that is their legal designation to follow the TTB requirements. Uh, some states also have differing requirements. Uh, Texas, by the way, if you are a certain alcohol by volume uh, designation, you have to be labeled as ale in Texas. Uh, I forget exactly what it is, but it's something ridiculous. Like if you're above 5.2%, it's legally ale, which doesn't make any sense. We all know as brewers, like, that doesn't make it ale. Uh, that could be a logger as well, but they don't care. Uh, welcome to government. So if your beer does not have one of these words on it, they will send it back and tell you that you need to have a class designation on it. So if the word ale is in your fanciful name, it's not separate. That's not part of its class or type distinction. Uh, Let's say we had Henderson Ale. If that's part of the name of the beer, part of the brand name of the beer, that is not its legal class designation, you also have to have in a separate section the designation of ale somewhere else. And that might be something that we're, uh, we're covering here. But, uh, so while they recognize India Pale Ale as a class, the abbreviation IPA is not sufficient, so if you have IPA on your beer, somewhere you either have to spell out India Pale Ale, or you have to just write ale, or one of the other class type distinctions somewhere. Uh, the class designation here on this one is missing. Uh, even though it says beer right here, that is not uh, a class designation, that is part of the name. Now it's silly, but They'll send it back. Uh, Dunkelweizen, uh, other types like Hefeweizen, Bach, Triple, Beer, spelled the German way, is not a legal class designation. They will send it back. <clears throat> Products not known to the trade under a particular designation are commonly called malt beverage specialty products. Uh, those are going to require a formula submittal, submission, and it just, we're likely not going to really see too much of an issue with that. Okay, okay. So then we get into using 
ingredients that are not on their list of approved ingredients. So if you use something that's not on their list that um, they have posted, you have to submit a formula and you have to include it in the name. So, for example, they're using a hazelnut porter. So hazelnut is not an approved ingredient, so you have to submit a formula, formula to the government and they will decide whether or not it's approved. And, and so doing, the fanciful name, so you've called it hazelnut porter, it's not sufficient to be labeled. You have to designate it as a porter brewed with hazelnuts or porter with hazelnuts. So some issues um, that we see here. Uh, the fanciful name is not listed, which you think you would include that, but sometimes mistakes happen. Uh, so also your statement of composition is missing the base beer. So in the previous example, had it not been a porter, if it had just been uh, stout, or now that is one of the base beers. Let's say it was a hazelnut triple, and triple with hazelnuts would not work because that's not a base beer designation. You would have to say ale uh, with hazelnuts. So we can see here just a further designation see why it was rejected here because it just said elderberry ale it didn't have its fanciful name which you can see here its fanciful name is happily elder after it is an ale with elderberries that's why it was approved because it had that beer class designation along with the specialty ingredient uh, that was included in the recipe in the formulation submitted So some ingredients are exempt from formulas, and, and that list is available there. Uh, is the formula required? The question is very clearly laid out in that list of ingredients. Uh, so let's say you had a beer that you're going to be using raspberry puree. Uh, is the formula required? No, you don't have to submit a formula, but you do have to still make a statement of composition. So you've got fruit ale, raspberry ale, or ale with natural flavor, or ale with raspberries. Um, I'd probably go with ale with raspberries. That's going to be uh, the better, better one of those choices there. You still have to have a designation or statement of composition. So you got to, if you're using raspberry or any other fruit puree that is on the approved list, you got to basically say it on your label that you have. <coughs> One thing to note here, aging of a product does not need to be called out as part of it. Uh, the process of aging beer in barrels is exempt. Uh, so while it's important for you to put on a label that it was aged in a barrel because that is huge marketing information, it is not legally required by the TTB. As long as your saves do not have a discernible quantity of spirits or wine. So anytime you get a barrel, from a distillery. It's empty. There's just more examples here. Yeah, we've done that, covered that. Covered that. Alright, so now geographical names. Geographical names are important um, because they're trying to prevent breweries from potentially misrepresenting their product as a product of another country. So we have a Hefeweizen that we list as a Bavarian Hefeweizen because I feel that accurately uh, portrays the style. We were asked to either directly underneath that put a statement of product of USA, that way nobody can, can be confused that we imported the beer from Bavaria, which doesn't exist anymore. Or you have to put Bavarian style Hefeweizen or Bavarian style wheat beer. Uh, especially since they don't recognize Hefeweizen, wheat beer would be your designation on that one. Uh, so 
that's what they're covering here. You have to either call it a style. So if you're making a Czech Pilsner, it has to be a Czech style Pilsner or a Czech Pilsner product of USA directly underneath of it. The one geographical thing that has lost its geographical significance is India Pale Ale. The government has decided that they no longer think that that makes a geographical designation because the style is so popular and people recognize that it's not specifically an India product or a product made in India. Uh, so you can put India Pale Ale on your beer and not have to make that regional designation of product of USA because the government has decided that people are smart enough to know that it's not made in India. <clears throat> so here are the list of the names that have lost the geographical significance. India Pale Ale, Baltic Porter, Bohemian, Russian Imperial Stout, Imperial Russian Stout, Scotch Ale, Scottish Ale. However, these are the ones that require that geographical uh, qualifier. So Belgian, Berliner, English, Irish, Kolsch. Uh, part of that is because uh, the Cologne, the Kolsch Convention in Germany pretty much made everybody uh, require that. Uh, Mexican, Vienna, New England, or West Coast or similar. Uh, that's not a complete list. Go to the government's website if you want a complete list. If you're in any doubt and you don't want to get a return to cola, put product of USA underneath of it and cover your bases. India Pale Ale has lost its geographic significance. India Pale Lager, they've decided, has not. So, yeah, you're smart enough to decide that India Pale Ale is not made in India. But in India Pale Lager, well, we need to make sure people know that that's not made in India. Cake collars. Tell me why they thought it was a good idea to put bottle crowns there. Okie dokie. Cakes are consumer containers, just like bottles or cans. They're just a large consumer container. So, you have to have government information listed on there. Everything can be handwritten on there, except for the government warnings that are required to be on there. Um, these can also be uh, cake caps, collars, stickers, or a combination of any of these formats. <clears throat> So to get a cola, to get a label approval for a keg collar, a couple things. You got to have, number one, uh, they listed this as, uh, yeah, never mind, it's al alcohol divide. It cannot be blank to be approved. You have to have something written there. But it is uh, allowable revision post-approval. So you get a label approved, you need to change that. Let's say this batch is a little higher, you can change that without getting another approval. Um, I guess they understand that, hey, it's a living product, there's a possibility that it might not be exactly the same. <clears throat> All right, so they are picky. So this one here didn't get approved because the S in the G in the Surgeon General is not capitalized. Uh, so when they provide you with the example of what the warnings need to say, it's got to be 100% exactly the same. 